community and thank you so much for joining us for the March in Fuel Developer Community Call. We just want to take a moment to thank you, the Web3 community, especially Web3 Forum, for helping make this all possible. As always, I'm Chris Antonio, your friendly neighborhood platform advocate. You can find me at C. Antonio on Twitter. Great agenda today. It's some really exciting news. First, we have Tobias. He is a uh, product manager for Diligence Funding, and he's going to announce the uh, general availability release of our funding product. Funding is a really cool, dynamic tool that basically lets you test the function of your smart contract by kind of bombarding it by with like millions of different test inputs to proactively find security vulnerabilities and to preempt exploits. Uh, before you go to moment, which will help you expedite your main contract uh, review and audit, uh, as well as keeping your contract more safe. Then we have Bjorn from HAL, a really cool product that just joined consensus. Um, HAL allows you to expose rich notification functionality, such as sending your users push notifications when there are certain EVM changes to keep your users abreast of any changes that they want to know about. And finally, we have Maya, um, Year of product who wants to announce uh, the general availability release of the NFT API that allows you to incorporate rich NFT functionality into your app using standard technology such as a REST API or a TypeScript SDK, for instance, um, that allows you to query rich NFT metadata and also allows you to mint NFTs uh, programmatically. Okay, so first off, uh, we, we will have uh, Tobias. Uh, you might might be muted. Hey, everybody! Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, for the invitation, and thank you very much for the chance to um, introduce diligence fuzzing. And as you already said correctly. Um, we uh, announced general availability just this week on Tuesday. So I'm very, very happy to share you and introduce you um, to fuzzing in general. But um, first of all, I thought it would be very important because we always like go along and assume that everybody knows what fuzzing is. Um, so I thought um, it should give a little introduction like to the concept of fuzzing, first of all, and then introduce what diligence fuzzing can do for you, basically. Um, so fuzzing in general, um, everything started basically with black box fuzzing. And as Chris already mentioned, it's kind of basically bom bombarding your code with inputs um, in, in order to provoke like an unintended behavior of your code. And it's also like this, this image of a monkey army basically trying, trying to mess with your code and trying to give random inputs and just to see if it breaks at some point. The big, the big uh, point here is it's random inputs. That means it's really just randomly generated, but a lot of them. So thousands, thousands of them per second. And oh, the longer you do it, then it's eventually it will be millions of inputs. And what a fuzzer does basically is it goes there pretty naively, bombards your code with inputs and explores your code, basically learns your code base. Because with every input, it um, tries, of course, to reach more of your code. So basically unlock a new path and then try new inputs on that path, for example. So it's basically um, exploring your code. And that means, of course, coverage is key, right? You want, you want the fuzzer um, who's behaving like a user, basically, um, to cover most uh, or like all of your code and then um, test it thoroughly in order to be sure that there's no unintended behavior somewhere or to find bugs, of course. So 
the the advantage here is of course that it's many many inputs so not only like in unit testing for example where you have to come up with your inputs one at a time and you come up with them yourself but um, to use the machine to generate these inputs and um, the the fun thing with a randomly generated aspect is that you want to um, that you want to explore edge, edge cases so maybe give inputs to the code that you would would have never come up with um, and, and that's the big advantage and this is the, the the big promise of fuzzing and that's also why it, it, it's more popular recently as a as a testing approach um, the problem with black box fuzzing is it's still pretty primitive and this is by no means disrespectful against our dear friends the chimpanzees which are we all know are very intelligent already but um, in in, in, the, in the virtual monkey army, this is still random and untargeted. So the question is, um, how can we make that a bit smarter, right? And um, Valentin Rustotz, who is the 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 um, yeah the, the father of of Harvey, our fuzzing engine, always uh, refers to basically symbolic execution and other approaches like formal verification of the the standard um, of, of white box, basically. Um, where the problem is that these these approaches are different from from fuzzing, as in they are more complete, but also very slow. And um, because of their approach itself, is is very uh, it's not scalable. So it's very bad at large systems. So the the question is basically um, how can we make black box fuzzing a little more lighter? So push it towards white box. And um, that's where we end up with um, a word that you might have heard already, um, the field of gray box fuzzing. So gray box fuzzing is basically a fuzzer which has some heuristics that make it a bit smarter, a bit more targeted, and therefore, of course, faster. Um, I think the core aspect always is that, that it's coverage guided. Basically means that whenever the fuzzer found a new path or covered a new path in your code, it memorizes that, builds a corpus of these of these um, inputs, and then generates new inputs based on that. So it's not purely random. It's not um, it's not uh, like primitive mutations, but it mutates just interesting finds. Basically, there are um, other cool things that uh, that the fuzzer can do. For example, it can predict inputs even. So for some for some conditionals to reach new paths, it would be able to. Um, basically predict the next input that's necessary to unlock a new path and to, to cover more of your code. And it would also be able to um, simulate transaction se uh, sequences. Um, of course, within smart contracts and smart contract systems, um, lots of the logic of your smart contract is only unlocked after a sequence of transactions. And that's also, um, if, you, if you make a fuzzer doing that, um, that, that lets him unlock more of your code and test deeper, um, especially in terms of business logic. There are more things that um, the fuzzer can do, and you can you can check out more features of, of diligence fuzzing um, in our blog, for example. But these are like three really important features that, that make it really fast. Um, the goal stays the same, of course, right? We want to test as many edge cases as possible, and we want to do so fast. Um, but the advantage here is that um, yeah, it's faster, it's targeted, and uh, it's it's way higher coverage. So with these measures, we can we can improve the fuzzer by magnitudes. So basically, the monkey army is kind of not so primitive anymore. Um, it's, it's very it's, it's very great and cool to see to which heights a fuzzer can go these days. And um, there are some other fuzzers out there already, like um, Echidna and um, also from Echidna is from Trail of Bits, um, then also the Foundry fuzzer. Um, and as far as we know, the, the uh, Trail of Bits fuzzer Medusa, which dropped this week, I think, um, is also coverage guided. Uh, but so far, that's the only one that we are aware of, um, apart from diligence fuzzing. Um, the only disadvantage with this is, of course, that um, it's still not, there's still no formal verification. That means of course, the fuzzer can can only in a, in a certain time reach so much of your code and test so much of your code, right? There's still a, a randomness to it. Um, that means basically it depends really on how long you let the fuzzer shoot inputs on your code. 
and uh, you can never be 100 percent sure but you can reach a very very fairly certain uh, confident confidence level there is another aspect that comes into play which is very interesting when we talk about fuzzing because so far um you could use the fuzzer for for example different unit tests of course you can you can deploy it on your entire code base but that is it can take a long time to to find uh, unintended behavior or any bugs um so what has been used so far is basically to put it on top of your unit tests or like parts of your tests um or write some specific harnesses for it or some some manually written test setup where you would deploy the, the fuzzer and basically set the target and say hey um I'm I'm writing this function call and there's a variable and this variable I want you to fuzz. So this variable I want you to um, uh, randomly set in, in all the all the different ways so that we can uh, provoke some in unintended behavior. And that's basically um, still very restricted, right? Um, so the power of fuzzing, uh, fuzz, the power of fuzzing, sorry, um, is then very yeah very restricted to one point. Of course, it's a cool way of, of targeting already, but but there there's more, there's some potential. And that's where property-based fuzzing comes into play. Um, yeah, so property-based testing basically means you describe some rules about the intended behavior, um, but you describe them as general, like global properties of your code. So you just describe what your code should do and what, sh what it should not do, and then tell the fuzzer, okay, check the entire code base and see if, any of your inputs breaks these rules, right? So that means um, you still generate these, these test cases, basically, or it, it means it, it generates test cases for you based on these rules. So you don't um, have to write them your own uh, one by one. And as I already said, uh, you can fuzz entire systems, like entire smart contract systems for which you define these rules. Um, and to do that, we, we created Scribble, uh, which is a specification language. Um, and yeah, Scribble basically is, is very, very easy. Um, it allows you to, and I'll show you how, how that works here. It allows you to um, write an inline comment, for example, this one here, um, which in that case, for example, makes sure it's, like, it's just a rule that says, okay, that the, the sum of all balances in this code should always be equal to the total supply. So that there should be no way of magically creating tokens somewhere. And Scribble now goes ahead and automatically extends your code base with checks and um, assertions so that, so that the fuzzer now can go ahead and check for exactly that rule. And this happens automatically, so you don't have to do anything. Um, and that's pretty great. So it's basically just an, an inline comment, and this is, this is what an uh, annotated token looks like. So these, these comments, as you can see here, this is Scribble. And we call it like a scribbled contract or a, a scribbled function. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically the, the groundwork where the fuzzer can, can work. Scribble is open source and for free. So you can use it with other fuzzers as well. Um, but of course, it works with uh, delicious fuzzing really, really great. Um, yeah. So the idea was basically cool property based testing and gray box fuzzing. That's insane. Um, let's try this. And this is the idea behind diligence fuzzing. So it's really just describe the intended behavior of a code in, in, in scribble annotations. So for example, do A, uh, do B, but never do C. Then unleash the, the monkey army or the monkey special squad um, and use these use the power of the fuzzer to try to break those rules. And in the end, uh, yeah, you get a report about it and see how these rules were broken. And yeah, you go and fix your code. Uh, yeah, and this is basically the two the two steps to to use fuzzing, and then in the third step you get your your report. Scribble, as I said, open source and for free. Um, you can use it with any other tool as well. Dil um, diligence fuzzing, we offer it as a service, so you can now since Tuesday openly just create your account and go wild basically. And how that looks like is this. So this is um, the platform, the fuzzing platform, and this is your report. That means during a fuzzing campaign, as we call it, so a fuzz run, we call it fuzzing campaign, um, you would see thousands of test seconds per second. You would see the coverage going up, um, of course, total duration. 
and the residual risk as an indicator of how many vulnerabilities or what's the chance of finding another vulnerability um, in the next minute and every other minute of fuzzing. And um, the important part we want to look at is, is here, the properties. Did it, did it manage to fail of the, one of the properties or not? And in that case, it did. And it will show you exactly where. So here we have um, one of those assertions that's Cribble created. The puzzle managed to, to break those assertions and it shows you exactly how. So this is, this is the transaction that it took um, to break the assertion. Now you can basically go back and see, okay, well, what, what went wrong? Um, and yeah, fix your code. And this is um, available to you uh, where you can just manage your, um, manage your fuzzing campaigns. This is what you will see. All right. Thank yeah. you so much, Tobias. And yep. is it true that diligence fuzzing also generates or automatically generates unit and system tests for you as well, based on the Scribble uh, annotations? Yeah, basically, since it generates every input, so you don't have to write um, unit tests anymore. No. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but of course, oh. that means also if you if you've written already unit tests, and so don't don't throw them away. You can still um, <laughs> deploy the fuzzer on them, of course, right? So it's not it's not for nothing. Cool, yeah, and there's a generous free tier, so definitely check it out, everyone. Oh yeah, yeah, there's a free trial. Um, just go to the website, we will post it afterwards. Um, yeah, grab your, grab your free trial and just test it, test it out. Cool, yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely send that link out to our users in an email afterwards, and uh, hopefully post it in chat if we have it ready. But yeah, thank you so much, Toby. That was awesome. Cool, thank you guys. Uh, Bjorn, did you want to go next? Yeah, sure. So let me get this up. All right. Thank you for having me. So my name is Bjorn. I'm former head of engineering at, at HAL. And HAL was recently acquired by Consensus. And now I'm a technical lead here at Infura. Uh, since this is a recent acquisition by Consensus, I can't show you Infura products. But what I wanted to do and use this time for is to tell you about the products that HAL had. And since that will definitely have shape and impact the products that we will be releasing within Infura in the, in the coming months. So the agenda here is I want to tell you a little bit about what HAL was. Uh, what products it had, what you could do with those products, and then go a little bit into what that means for consensus and the products that we will be releasing that, uh, within that. So first off, what is HAL? So HAL is a, is a company that was built to create products related to Web3 visibility and automation. It was basically an IFTT system for Web3, and then it went a little bit further into data pipelines and, and more kind of data indexing things. Uh, HAL has two main products. Uh, one of them is HAL Notify, which is more retail and social oriented. And another one which is HAL Streams, which is more developer oriented. And we're going to take a look at each one in turn and, and kind of explore what you could do with them. So if we start by taking a look at the HAL Notify product, uh, and this is all about taking some inputs of things that are happening on chain uh, and, and looking hard at those inputs and saying like, do I want to get notified when, when these things are happening and then executing some action based on that. And, and this was like, we started off by building a very generic way of doing this. So, so this would allow you to listen to any kind of on-chain event. So if a smart contract was emitting an event, you would really dig into that event and, and get notified if that event 
fulfilled a certain criteria. You could also listen to all transactions, and there you could take into who's sending those transactions, what's the value of them, who is it for, what is it interacting with, and so forth. And also very, very powerful, it was able to call and query any kind of smart contract view function. So any smart contract out there that, that had a view function that took a, from parameters, you would automate calling that smart function uh, or uh, view function and get notified if those values changed as you wanted. So how it did that is, is by listening to those things, then passing all of the data that came back and using built-in comparators to check if the values fall within your range. And this is, for example, if you're, if you're looking for, a, for an event that's happening on a ERC-20 contract, like you could look if, if that's a trans, like, transaction event and who is the who is it getting sent to, what's the balance of, and all those stuff. So you could really dig into what you want to get notified on and only get notified on those things. Uh, and then based on like this falling within the range that you wanted to, you could take action on this. And this was very powerful as, as this allowed you to kind of build up any kind of, of listening service that you wanted to on chain. Uh, but this was technical as well. Like you need to know how smart contracts work. You need to be able to say okay, what kind of events are those smart contracts emitting, in what topics are those addresses or UNs or, or, or variables and kind of go from there. So while this was very valuable and we had a lot of power users using this, this was not getting to the normal retail web three user base. So we, we thought a little bit about that and while it was great supporting the power users, we also wanted to support um, normal, more regular rating and, and retail users. So once we had these primitives of knowing how to listen to any kind of on-chain data, uh, we pre-packaged them into DAP specific uh, and we called them recipes. And this could be almost anything. And we took most of the uh, very popular DAPs to, for example, on Aave. Like Aave has a smart contract that you can query for the health factor of your position. So, so we created all of that. So we put in the address of the Aave contract, where you should put your address, what you wanted your health factor to be. And just by doing that in a few clicks, you could actually set up a notification to get notified if your health factor is dropping below something that you want to take action on. And those actions could be during up that position, it could be liquidating that position, it could be anything you want to do. So we did this for we did this for a lot of the protocols out there. So we did this for others, but we also did this and Uniswap, but we also did this for non-chain actions. So for example, snapshot. A lot of DAOs use snapshot to know about uh, upcoming proposals or changes and kind of engage their community. And we also did like an integration with snapshot that allowed community managers or anybody to get notified as new proposals are being submitted, opened, about to close, uh, so, so they can kind of reach out to their community and, and engage with them more. So, this is how Notify and we covered both the kind of primitives, which are just listening to any kind of on-chain data and taking action on it. And also recipes is where we, we kind of uh, pre-packaged those primitives into DAP specific solutions. Uh, the other product that HAL had was HAL Streams. And this is a more data pipeline, data indexing kind of product. Uh, it was built on a lot of the same technology as HAL Notify. So it uses the same kind of blockchain listener to, to follow along all transactions, all blocks that are happening, any kind of event that are happening on chain. Uh, it uses the same kind of filtering logics and primitives to, to know when it should alert you or notify you or let you know that something is happening. But it had a lot more developer-focused destinations. So while HAL notify things like Telegram, Discord, Twitter, email, 
more kind of how can I notify some people? How can I how can I interact with this? Uh, streams are more of a developer focused so, so you could inject this data straight into your database you could you could push it to a queue you could you would get a webhook for those data parts that you wanted so this was more about listening to things that you knew would happen on chain and getting them into your data store where you could do further analysis or, or any kind of uh, work or workflow that you wanted to kick off based on that um, I want to take a few minutes to talk about what you could do with it and what people are using HAL in the wild for right now. Uh, and th that is those things, for example, for notifying. Like we have a lot of, of DeFi users who are using it to stay safe. I like know their positions across multiple lending protocols, multiple DeFi protocols. Uh, there's quite many community bots that are powered by HAL that are posting when things change to Discord or Telegram channels that, that both internal um, developers are watching, but also for the community. And, and then, of course, the pre-made protocol specific alerts that people have created or, or, or came to us and we created with them and, and we have released and integrated with. On the stream side, I, it has been used to monitor farm accounts. So, so if you have a farm account and you need to pay yield on that farm account, you need to have the balance topped up. So, so this this is, has been used by farm account to monitor the balance and, and take action if they need to shore them up. Rob are used for NFT airdrops and by some traders to monitor yield across chains and across protocols. So it's definitely as we as we move into how can we bring this things into Infura, we are of course looking to for feedback on what people are using this for and how we can continue to support all of those use cases for a bigger audience. Yeah, and with HAL joining consensus, like our, our job now is just to kind of bring this to the, the consensus ecosystem and, and, and both for internal use, but also to, to release as, as value add services within Infura. And that's what we will be doing in the coming months. So um, I would like to thank you for this time. Uh, and if you, if you would like to know more, please ask questions or, or send them over and, and we can try to take a look. And we will probably open a beta test somewhat soon. And we'd love to see some of you there. Uh, but without further ado, I think I would like to hand it over to Chris again. Cool. Thank you so much, Bjorn. I have you heard of the platform Zapier or? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of think of uh, how almost as like like a Web three blockchain Zapier for your smart contract, right? You, you have all these pre built integrations that let you uh, perform these, you know, all like you call them recipes. It, yeah. It's it's super awesome. Really cool stuff. Well, yeah, thank you so much for joining. And uh, yeah, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of the session uh, if anyone has questions for about how. But next up, we have uh, Naya, who's going to be talking about the NFT API uh, GA. So uh, go ahead and take it away, Naya. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. I am going to... I have some slides for you today. Just a minute. All right. Can everybody see my can everybody see my screen? Yes. All right, great. So um okay, let's hide this. Great. All right. So hopefully um many of you know that we've been working uh, on diligently towards the GA of our uh, NFT product. And I'm happy to announce that uh, NFT Suite is now in GA. We um, This was announced at the Game Developer Conference a couple of weeks ago. So for those of you who haven't uh, tried it, we uh, request you to go do it, please. Especially if you have, uh, whether you're trying it out or whether you have any business or personal needs that require NFTs, we, uh, we think we have a pretty comprehensive uh, set of services for you. 
Um, my colleague Salim is also on this call and he, I'm going to give you a quick overview and what Salim is going to do is give you a demo on what we have available. So um, before we get started, just a little bit of like, you know, uh, what prompted us to kind of work uh, work on this. So builders are in Web3 are still facing some common fundamental challenges. Uh, we think that, you know, there, the space is still nascent. We, Web3 builders, still need more plug and play secured and multi-chain NFT features as they go through the NFT life cycle. The minting and reading of NFTs is still a little cumbersome um, and, and the ecosystem is still maturing. Um, NFT builders what we think they really need is the uh, is uh, secured NFT smart contracts uh, templates that can connect to multiple networks so people can uh, build their NFT contracts very quickly. And once they do, they they want to be able to uh, have a toolkit that really provides them a um, set of services that the builders can use to monitor the NFT activity, mint the NFTs, optimize NFT transactions and gas, store the NFT data uh, on, um, uh, store their NFT data and files on decentralized storage, read the information, uh, index the uh, data, et cetera, and, and do all of this on the most uh, active blockchain networks. So as you can see, the what we believe the NFT value stack is uh, from the bottom up, as I just mentioned, we have kind of mapped an Infura NFT stack for, uh, for NFTs as well. There are many different, when we started, we only had um, about, when we started with closed beta a few months ago, we really only had a few endpoints, we just had a um, one simple template for writing. So we believe that most NFT use cases um, require certain patterns. And uh, one of the things that we focused on building along with providing read endpoints was an SDK and a few templates that were pre-audited and pre-tested uh, by uh, Diligence, uh, our product that uh, Toby just talked about in uh, great detail. And so this allows the uh, the minting of NFTs to be accelerated at, uh, uh, at a pretty rapid pace. So if you're a Web3 developer, actually using our, um, using if you want to mint an NFT using our uh, SDK, it really takes you maybe at an average five minutes. And if you're a Web2 developer or a non-developer, just following our docs, uh, when we tested out with some developers, really only about took about 30 minutes or so. So what we have is pretty phenomenal. When we started this, we only had about three endpoints. And, and as Salim is going to demo for you in just a few minutes, now we have 14 endpoints. We have three templates, in, and the SDK is available in multiple languages. Uh, these 14 endpoints also cover about 85% of most use cases. As you can see, uh, when we started on the left-hand side, our NFT endpoints were fairly were very they, they started with more fundamental use cases where you wanted to get information about um just the nft metadata the collection made metadata and over time we have expanded these endpoints to get uh transaction history transfer information uh owner information uh pricing information this allows you to cover more comprehensive cases more complex cases right provenance uh etc and there is um, what you see highlighted here are all the endpoints. Uh, all the endpoints, you can see the number of uh, layer one and layer two um, networks that we support as well. And um, you can also, here you can now also take a look at some of the templates and the ERC uh, standards that we're going to continue to support over time. Uh, at a very high level, our, uh, the API uh, SDK and architecture kind of wraps both the, um, you know, the read app APIs as well as the write endpoints or a template library. Uh, and it's built on top of Infura, uh, Infura RPC, which you guys already know in great detail. So uh, I'm going to hand off in just a minute to Celine, who's going to actually demo the product for you very, uh, very quickly. But I, before I uh, before I end, I kind of want to tell you that we will continue to add new capabilities here, like integration with notifications through HAL, 
uh, uh, lazy minting. All our templates will be audited as we add new templates. All our all of them will be added uh, audited through uh, pre audited through diligence. And we are thinking about new features all the time, like analytics, etc. Uh, just before we end, this is just an example of our swagger, which shows you all the endpoints that comprehensive endpoints that are available. Uh, if you if you want to learn more, if you want to connect with me, uh, please reach out to me on Twitter or Telegram or LinkedIn, and I'll be happy to give you more information. Just um, uh, if you have any questions, just reach out. Um, uh, once again, I am a GM here at Infuro. Thank you so much, Salim. Please take it away. Yes. Uh... Hello, everyone. I don't know if I, I am already on this stage or not. Yeah, we can see we can hear you. So you can just go ahead and share. I'm going to share my screen. No. Uh, do you see my screen? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, we see it. So, hello, everyone. I'm Salim from the NFT uh, team from the Infura NFT team. And today I'm going to uh, to do for you a quick demonstration of, uh, of our product. So uh, first of all, you need to create, you need to go on your Infura dashboard and log in using your credential and create a Web3 project. So I'll just do create a test project. Once it's done, uh you can go on the list of the endpoint and you will see the nft api available on the list of endpoint here so uh in, to do this demo i'm going to use the swagger documentation but that's also possible to do it using curve command or uh, a postman collection so uh, you can go to the uh, the infura docs you will find the link of our swagger documentation i'm going to open it uh you need to uh to authenticate using a basic auth username and password. So for the username, you need to use your API key here from your Infura dashboard, from your Web3 uh, project just created before. So I'm going to paste it here. And for the password, you can find it on security, which is an API key secret. So once it's done, uh, let's say for example, I'm uh, I'm a user and I want to get uh, a list of uh, of NFT for a specific collection. So I will go to this endpoint here, click on try it out. I have to provide some information like the chain ID. For example, I'm going to put one uh, for the uh, the contract address. I will keep the same. Execute. And as you can see here, we have. Uh, a size of 100 per range, and uh, we have the total, and you can find on the asset property all the information related to your, to your NFT, like contract, token ID, metadata, description, attribute, etc. And let's say, for example, now I want to go to the next page, you have to use the cursor that I'm getting here. Pops uh, it here. Executes. And now from page zero, I'm now in the page one, I'm, I'm getting the next range. Okay, so uh, for example, if I want to, to get now the, the, the metadata related to this collection, there is an endpoint for that one, and you can just click on try it out here, pass your collection uh, uh, contact address, and here you go. We can, you can see the, the metadata of my collection here. Uh, we are providing, uh, like uh, Nina said just before me, we are providing 14 endpoints and uh, you can find a lot of information such as all information related to the transfer. You can find transfer from block to block using the block hash, the transfer related to an NFT or to uh, to wallet address and uh, the information related to metadata and, uh, and the lowest price. If you want to, to, to know more, you can check the documentation here on, from, on the Enfura uh, page. Uh, we have the list of supported network like uh, 9S8 before me uh, here, and you can find all the endpoints um, by section, transfer, metadata, collection, ownership, and uh, we are providing uh, some examples if you scroll down. 
uh, that's it for me. So I'm available to answer any question you have, and uh, I'm going to to give the hand to, to Chris now. Thank you for attending. Cool. Thank you so much for that demo, Salim. Yeah. So the NFT API is a great product, um, and it's it's available for you for you all to use. So definitely check it out. Uh, next up, we are going to be going over a really cool product. Let me bring it up one sec. So we have this great resource for you called the Developer's Guide to the Web3 Stack. This is a super comprehensive, like high level view of basically everything you need to know to start your Web3 development journey. It goes through everything from like the background of blockchains, uh, how blockchains operate as finite state machines, uh, the evolution from a static web one to a dynamic web two to uh, a web three uh, with that's more of a read write uh, own system. Um, so it gives you the history and the background, and then it starts giving you some of the uh, the practical technical knowledge, such as information about smart contracts. Um, Smart contract programming languages such as Solidity, front end libraries, node providers. It's an amazing resource uh, that we shared in the chat. And we will also send that out uh, in the email. Um, so if you're looking for a place to get started as a Web3 developer, especially if you have some Web2 development experience, um, this is definitely the go-to. Like, Definitely check out this amazing article written by our um, amazing in-house author, uh, Clarissa Watson. Uh, and yeah, it just goes over pretty much everything you need to know. Uh, testing, oracles like Chainlink that let you bring in external information into your contract. Um, automation, identity management, super awesome. And then we also have the Infura faucet. Um, so basically you can get up to 0 0.5 Sepulia ETH per day. Um, as you're all aware, uh, Gurley ETH, there's a bit of a scarcity issue um, so the Ethereum Foundation actually deprecated that test network. So we're all moving over to Sepolia now. And Infura is right there with you uh, with this faucet. Um, so basically, all you need to do is navigate to infura.io slash faucet. Uh, click on the login button. If you're already part of Infura, you just log in. And then that should redirect you back to the faucet page. Uh, go ahead and go into your MetaMask extension. Make sure to uh, select the Sepolia test network. And if your MetaMask is not displaying test networks, you could click here to go to show and hide and toggle that option on. So go ahead and go to Sepolia network. Copy your address and click Receive ETH. Um, so th this is kind of cool here. So, so now we're just waiting for this transaction to actually be approved. Uh, but when that be when that transaction is approved, we actually use HAL to uh, notify this page. Uh, so that you know when um, your transaction has been approved, and now you have a history of all of your transactions. Um, 
yeah, I'm seeing in the chat some good feedback on the faucets. So, yeah, I'm glad it's all working for you. Um, you, you can encounter an error. Um, you, the most common error is um, we're just refilling the faucet. So it, it's a uh, it's a ephemeral, it's a temporary issue. Uh, so basically just come back in five minutes and try again. That's the most common problem. Um, if it's a persistent issue, like be sure to reach out to us and we'll we'll try to we'll definitely get on that for you to help fix. Um, but yeah, this is an awesome resource. Uh, definitely check it out. And um, as KB the Capybara posted in chat, uh, we have a tutorial video walking you through it. Uh, it also it walks you through some of the error cases. Uh, so let me see. Yeah, so let's go into uh, Q and A now. Uh, bear with me one minute. So here's a question. Uh, in what level will consensus be decentralized? Any plan blocks some countries from consensus? Uh, I mean, I, I could specifically speak to Infura. Let me see one sec. Oh, Infura is moving towards a decentralized model where instead of having a, a single infrastructure provider uh, serving your blockchain APIs, we have a network of, uh, of infrastructure providers. Um, so, so that removes, you know, that single point of failure. So now, so now we are um, this robust global network of infrastructure providers where uh, the best provider for you is chosen automatically uh, and you don't have to, and all that complexity is abstracted away from you. So we have to maintain uh, the Web3 eth ethos of decentralization uh, while also providing a high level of throughput and service and availability. Um, and th that is a program that's currently going on. Uh, we we are we we have an early access program for it, and uh, that we have lots of articles and learning materials that you could check out to learn more about that plan. Let's see. Uh, Bjorn, uh, are you available? Sure. Yeah, so we have some questions. Uh, how does uh, how compare to something like Forta or Gelato? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think I, I posted some answers to those in the comments, but, but I can okay. put them here as well. So, so basically, Gelato is, is further along in the on-chain axioms while HAL was more focused on off-chain actions and notifications based on that. And on, on the Forta side, like Forta is very security focused, while HAL is a more general approach. So Forta is, is very much focused on, on bringing security to your smart contracts and how you do that. So, so I would even be, yeah, it's not solving the exact same problem and they're much more security focused than HAL was. Okay, great. Cool. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, so I see a question uh, where a user received issue starting transaction. 
uh, when they were trying to claim uh, Sapuli ETH from the faucet, uh, then that, that's related to us needing to refill the faucet. So just go ahead and try again in like five minutes and it should be good to go. Uh, that's all the questions I see. Let me see. All right, so just to close it out, be sure to check out the uh, developer's guide to the Web3 stack. It's a high-level view of basically the entire ecosystem. It's really comprehensive, really great. Definitely check it out. And as we mentioned before, you could look at the call to action on the screen for the Infuria's Polio Faucet, or we'll also be sending that link out and posting it in chat. And we'll be sending out links for the HAL website to learn more about all the exciting features that HAL ends, that HAL uh, exposes. Uh, we'll be sending out a link to that developer's guide to the Web3 stack, as well as uh, the test at Faucet and the tutorial video. And be sure to follow us on Infura. Or, sorry, be sure to follow us on Twitter and YouTube. And you can follow your uh, friendly neighborhood platform advocates on Twitter at Cian Italio and Lauren MXV. So once again, just thank you so much, Web3 community. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, you guys are so awesome, and we're so happy to just have you as part of the Fuhrer family. So thank you so much. And uh, everyone have an awesome day. Thank you. And and thank you so much to her amazing guests. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you, Toby, Naya, and Salim. Uh, your presentations were awesome. So much exciting news happened in the span of two weeks. So very exciting stuff. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.